Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. So when you're taking a calculus class, you generally learn a couple of different notations for the derivative. Perhaps you learn the Newton notation, which involves primes, as well as the Leibniz notation, which is like dy by dx. And well, in that process, you always learn that even though it looks like a fraction, dy over dx, this is not a fraction. It means the derivative of y with respect to x. But I'd like to introduce some mathematical objects today that really makes dy by dx a fraction, and that fraction coincides with the derivative. So in order to do that, we're gonna to need to look at something called a differential form. And well, I made a whole lot of videos on differential forms when this channel was really young, but we haven't looked at them for a while. So let's look a little bit about differential forms in order to maybe show how dy by dx is really a fraction. So what we're gonna do is look at a setting with two variables. And you can do this with any number of variables, one variables, two variables, you know, n variables, if you will. But I would say doing it with two variables is maybe just enough to get an idea of what's going on here. If we stuck with one variable, we might miss out a little bit. Although we will look at the special case of one variable to maybe answer this question or to address this statement here. Okay, so we've got a setting with two variables. So in a setting with two variables, we have three types of objects. We have what are called zero forms, but zero forms are just simply functions. And well, since we've got two variables here, it'll be a function of two variables, u and v. That, those are what we're using for the variables. And then we also have a so-called one form and an arbitrary one form in this setting, it looks like this. So it'll be a function of u and v times this thing called du. And that du is, well, maybe a simple or an elementary one form. And then here we'll have this is added to another function g of u v times another elementary one form dv. And we'll talk about what those are in just a second. And then we also have this idea of a two form and that looks like this. So it'll be a function of u and v times this thing that says dy or sorry du wedge dv. So now I guess before we move on, we probably should address this looming question. And uh, that is what are these, I'll call them extra parts here. By extra parts, I mean the, well, the elementary one forms, du and dv, and the elementary two form, du wedge dv. Well, here's what they are. So du and dv can be thought of as functions that take in a two vector. So a two vector because, well, we're working over two variables and they give you a number. So now this is not quite right. It's not perfectly right. They don't exactly take in a two vector. They take in a two vector at a point. You're actually in something called the tangent space. But I'll just maybe put a star here to point out that we're not exactly right. You can go look at those old videos of mine if you'd like to see something that's a bit more careful. Okay, and well, what do they do to that two vector? Well, in fact, we can explain it pretty easily. So du acts on the vector ab and just gives us that first component a. And then dv acts on this vector ab and it just gives us this second component b. So for the one forms, those are just projections. It's maybe not super interesting. Then what about the elementary two form, du wedge dv? So if we look at du wedge dv, what it does, instead of taking a single vector, it takes a pair of vectors. 
So I'll say a pair of vectors looks like this, R2 cross R2, and then it gives you a number. So of course you can say R2 cross R2 is like R4, so why don't we just have that? Well, we wanna think about it as like some sort of extension of what's going on up here. So it makes sense to have it be R2 cross R2. Okay, and then well, how does it work? Well, du wedge dv, so it needs to take in two vectors. I'll call them AC and BD. And what it does is it gives you the determinant of the matrix whose columns are those vectors. So the matrix A, B, C, D. So the, of course, this is A, D minus B, C. Now you might say, well, why did we stop at two forms? Why aren't there three forms or four forms? Well, it turns out that there are only as many forms or there are only n forms if you have n variables. And so that means that since we only have two variables here, we can't have a three form. And again, that's kind of inside of this technical definition, which you can check out those old videos if you'd like to. But I'd also like to note the following, and that is that if we were to do dv wedge du, maybe on this same set of vectors, well, we would get something like this. So this would be the determinant of this matrix where the columns have been switched. So here we have, it looks like B, A, D, C. But now let's observe that that is minus D, U, wedge, D, V applied to the same thing. So in fact, this wedge product of these differential one forms is in fact anti-commutative or skew symmetric maybe. Okay, so that being said, we just introduced a lot of these things, but in fact, we need one more idea in order to really go towards our main goal here of explaining how the derivative is really actually like a fraction. All right, math lovers, riddle me this. Why do we spend so much time memorizing formulas when the real magic happens when you understand the why behind them? If you're like me and love diving deep into the beauty of numbers, let me introduce you to Brilliant.org, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant is the ultimate playground for math enthusiasts. It's not about rote learning. It's about truly exploring math through interactive problem solving. Think puzzles, visual explanations, and those light bulb moments when everything finally clicks. Their courses are all about doing. So instead of just reading a bunch of theory, you're actually solving real problems step by step. It's not just about reading or memorizing, it's about doing. With Brilliant, you're tackling real problems and puzzles that make you think, really think. Content is designed by an award-winning team from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, Google, and more. Brilliant is also something that you can take on the go. The mobile app makes it easy to pick the time that works for you. Check out their course library. They have a new range of programming courses that are a great way to build foundations and learn real-world applications. You can start building programs with Python, learn essential coding elements, and more. But we're scientists here, so don't take my word for it. You should test it for yourself. A subscription would also make a great gift for the upcoming holiday season. Treat yourself to your unique hands-on experience by going to brilliant.org slash Michael Penn for a 30-day free trial and 20% off your annual subscription. Thanks once again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. And that extra idea is something called the exterior derivative. And here's what the exterior derivative does. So it connects the set of zero forms, one forms, and two forms. And how does it connect those sets? Well, it's some sort of map between them. So if you apply this exterior derivative, which we'll use the notion notation D for this exterior derivative, to a zero form, you get a one form. And if you apply it to a one form, you get a two form. But then how does that work? Well, let's maybe color code this a little bit. So let's say this is the blue arrow from zero forms to one forms. So if you apply this exterior derivative to a function, recall that zero forms are simply functions. Here's what you get. 
you get the partial of f with respect to u. So I'll use subscript notation. So f sub u is the partial of f with respect to u times du plus the partial of f with respect to v times dv. So there I transported this zero form, which was a function, to a one form. And now we need the, a way to apply this exterior derivative to a one form and get a two form. I'll color code that in red. So here's how that goes. We've got D of, maybe we'll say F uh, DU plus G DV. We're here, just recall that F and G are functions, so they depend on U and V. So it goes like this. So we'll have the partial of f with respect to v, and then dv wedge du, and then plus the partial of g with respect to u, du wedge dv. And well, there are some other things happening here where you might take the partial of f with respect to u and get a du wedged with itself, but that ends up canceling out. Um, for reasons that we saw before of this wedge product being anti-commutative. Okay, but now we can swap these two and pick up a minus sign, and in the end, what we'll see is that this turns into the partial of g with respect to u minus the partial of f with respect to v, du wedge dv. And now I'd like to give you a bit of a homework exercise and that homework exercise goes like this. You want to show that if you apply the exterior derivative twice, you always turn whatever you started with into zero. And so, of course, there are no three forms, so it only really makes sense to start with a zero form, apply the exterior derivative twice, and see that you get zero, or the zero two form. And this is actually like maybe a generalization of what's going on in vector calculus with the gradient, the curl, and the divergence. Recall that the divergence of the curl is zero, and then the curl of the gradient is also zero. Okay, so now we're actually finally ready to see uh, our original question or our original goal here. Okay, so let's look at a special case. And that special case will be the case where we have only one variable. Because we really want to answer this question or look at this idea, you know, specifically. Okay, so we've got one variable. And we'll say that that variable is x. But that means that we have a zero forms, which just looks like functions of x. And then we have one forms, which looks like functions of x dx. Okay, great. But now we'll do the following. So let's set y equal to f of x. And let's observe doing the exterior derivative of y, which we might just write dy, that's going to be equal to f prime of x dx. You might say, well, it should be the partial of f with respect to x dx, but since there's only one variable here, the partial derivative and the total derivative are the same. But now I think you can probably see how this is going to go. So now let's look at the following. Let's observe that dy over dx is simply f prime of x dx over dx, which gives us f prime of x. Of course, you know, we just divided by one of these one forms, elementary one forms, which we didn't really define super carefully. But you can define the idea of a nonlinear one form of which this reciprocal of dx would be if you work hard enough. But anyway, there you have it. Via these differential forms, we see that actually the fraction, which is the exterior derivative of y, over dx is in fact equal to f prime of x, which is essentially what we wanted to do. That being said, I want to go one step further and look at maybe a more general case, which is what's going on if we've got two variables like we did before. 
Okay, looking slightly more generally, let's say that we have y is a function of u and v. And then let's say that we have x is also a function of u and v. But that means that we can take the exterior derivative of y, and we'll see that that's the partial of f with respect to u du plus the partial of um, f with respect to v dv. By what we talked about over here with this uh, exterior derivative of zero forms with two variables. Okay, then also the exterior derivative of x is the same kind of thing. So gu du plus gv dv. But that means in this case we have dy by dx is, well, it's simply this really strange quotient of these one forms. And this is where we see that we really did kind of pull a fast one in our one variable case where it looked really nice. But in fact, I think we can do the same kind of thing here as well. And that would be, let's maybe look at the special case here where x is just equal to u. In other words, the function g of uv is just the function g of uv equals u. But that means that g sub u is one, that's the partial of g with respect to u in this case, because again, g is the simple function, and g of v equals zero, because there's no v there. But now, let's observe in this case, we have a dy by du, because I'll just replace this x with u, is in fact equal to what? Well, it's gonna be f sub u du, plus f sub v dv over du. But observe, we get some cancellation there. We have f sub u plus f sub v dv over du. And this may not seem super helpful, but we can cast this in terms of maybe the chain rule. And I'd like to do it like this. So notice up here at the top, we have y, which is a function of u and v. But then let's observe that uh, y, like I said, is a function of u and a function of v. But then to make this formula look like something's helpful, perhaps we would say v is also a function of u. But then, Observe that the formula that we came up with here by taking the quotient of one forms is exactly the chain rule formula that we would get from some sort of functional dependence diagram over there. Okay, so well, what did we do? Well, we introduced this notion of differential forms to really motivate us to really think of dy by dx as a fraction. Although I will admit this was a bit of a stretch. That being said, I think sometimes it's a good idea to look at something which is almost true, like dy by dx is almost a fraction all of the time, and look for some sort of setting where it is true. And that's a good place to stop.